Good morning. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, to hear the investment thesis for Milestone Pharmaceuticals. I'm Lorenz Muller. I'm the uh, Chief Commercial Officer. Uh, during the course of my presentation, I will be making forward-looking statements, and so I would encourage investors to review the risk factors in our SEC filings. Milestone is a phase three late stage cardiovascular company that is developing a novel therapy, a tripamil, for treating two different types of cardiac conditions or arrhythmias. The first is PSVT, which stands for paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. And the second is atrial fibrillation, which is well known to most investors, but this is in patients who have a rapid ventricular rate. The tripamil is a novel calcium channel blocker uh, developed in a nasal spray, which is fast acting, well tolerated and portable so that patients can treat themselves with, in these situations rather than going to a doctor's office or an emergency department. For our lead program in PSVT, we have recently, last month, filed a new drug application with the US FDA based on a successful phase three program, uh, the lead study of which, the RAPID study, was published recently in The Lancet. In atrial fibrillation, we uh, recently reported out a positive phase two study called the Rivera study, which was featured at the American Heart Association this, this a few weeks ago. Uh, and we've received uh, guidance from FDA and are preparing a phase three program, which I will explain to this audience. These are large markets. Uh, in the United States, we estimate around 2 million patients with PSVT diagnosed, growing to 2.6 by 2030, which we estimate to be our peak sales year. Atrial fibrillation is much larger, currently at five to six million patients diagnosed, growing to over 10 by 2030. A non-trivial number of patients also end up in the emergency department. In PSVT, almost 150,000 visits a year. In atrial fibrillation, almost 800,000. We estimate our target addressable market to be 40 to 60% of the PSVT population that has sufficient disease burden and burdensome episodes that they would wanna treat them with a tripamil. And in atrial fibrillation, we estimate 30 to 40% of patients have episodes of rapid rate that require treatment. So let's talk about these diseases. Uh, PSVT and atrial fibrillation are both highly symptomatic conditions uh, that uh, patients experience rapid onset of rate. So they have a very rapid heart rate in PSVT. It can be north of 200 beats a minute. In atrial fibrillation, more commonly 130 to 150 beats per minute, but in both cases, symptomatic, experiencing heart palpitations, chest pressure, shortness of breath, sudden onset of fatigue, lightheadedness, and anxiety. Most importantly, because patients have no treatments in the non-acute care, non-hospital setting, they feel powerless to control this disease. So as a result, many of them, as I showed you a minute ago, have to go to the emergency department to receive a time-consuming, disruptive, and not inexpensive treatment to either slow their rate in the case of atrial fibrillation or to convert the arrhythmia to sinus rhythm, as in the case of PSVT. This costs a lot of money to the patient, and it costs a lot of money to the healthcare system. The unmet need here then is for a simple, portable, and safe and effective treatment that a patient can administer at home to resolve these arrhythmias. Atripamil is a novel L-type non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker that was developed by Milestone. Uh, it is formulated in a nasal spray to have a rapid intravenous-like uptake of uh, achieving a Cmax of five to seven minutes. And it's also been modified to have a rapid uh, degradation in the bloodstream by esterases so that it doesn't linger after its treatment effects have been felt by the patient. Because it's a novel chemical entity and not a reformulation, a trip mill has patent protection in the United States through 2036. And we have global rights to the molecule as well. You can see in the lower right-hand corner an example of the product. 
It will be provided in uh, two devices in a convenient plastic container, which you can see will fit in a patient's pocket, since they need to have it with them to be able to treat an episode. I'll now talk about our lead program in PSVT and show you some of the clinical data supporting the filing with the NDA. The program contains one phase two program and four phase three programs, uh, both efficacy and open label safety. To date, we've exposed over 1,600 patients uh, to a tripamil, 70 milligrams or more, uh, and we've, as I mentioned, had a positive phase three, which I'll show you now. The RAPID study enrolled 706 patients that were in the uh, at-home setting, where they, when they experienced an episode, would take either 70 milligrams of a tripamil in a single device or matching placebo and, and, and address their episode. If within 10 minutes they were still experiencing symptoms, they were asked to take a repeat dose, the same strength, 70 milligrams, second device, to treat the episode. The primary endpoint, as I'll show you on the next slide, was highly significant. We also showed a meaningful reduction in emergency department visits compared to placebo and an excellent safety and tolerability profile. These are the primary results of the RAPID study, shown here on a Kaplan-Meier plot, showing the probability of conversion or the percent conversion on the y-axis against time. And you can see that two-thirds of patients who received a tripamil converted to sinus rhythm within 30 minutes, compared to only 31% on placebo. This effect was durable in that by an hour and a half, over 80% of patients had converted on a tripamil. That finding was statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. As I mentioned, we also showed a reduction in emergency department visits and medical interventions or rescue therapy. I would focus your attention on the right-hand panel where a pre-specified pooled analysis of our two studies showed a statistically significant reduction of almost 40% in emergency department visits. The safety profile and tolerability profile was excellent. The majority of the adverse events were isolated to the nasal route of administration in the form of nasal discomfort, congestion, runny nose, or minor or moderate nosebleeds, none of which required treatment. Importantly, we saw no evidence of any hypertensive effects or blood pressure lowering that resulted in dizziness or syncope. We also showed no uh, extreme conduction limitations, which would be things that would be problematic if the drug were to have them in an at-home setting because a patient could faint and hit their head. Fortunately, we have a very clean profile showing none of those properties. I'll now move on to our program uh, to treat patients with AFib with rapid ventricular rate with a rapid rate control. Here, our phase two program was completed in the acute care setting in the emergency department. Patients came in with atrial fibrillation at a rapid rate, and after an hour, uh, with a rate of over 110 beats per minute, were given drug or placebo, monitored for an hour with an endpoint of uh, how much did the heart rate go down, how quickly did it go down, and how long did it last over the hour compared to placebo. We also measured treatment satisfaction uh, as, a, as a patient reported outcome. These results were better than expected, the average patient had came into the study with a rate of 130 to 135 beats per minute, and the maximum reduction on drug was almost 35 beats per minute, on placebo, five beats per minute, for a difference in means of about 30 beats per minute, which was highly statistically significant, less than p-value, less than 0 0.0001. The time course of these results is plotted here on this chart, showing a very rapid onset of rate reduction compared to placebo, drug in purple, placebo in gray, uh, and that it was durable to uh, at least an hour. In fact, we showed it was durable to well over two hours with a single dose. We also measured treatment uh, symptom relief uh, with a patient-reported outcome that's been validated, the TSQM9, and we showed a statistically significant reduction in uh, symptoms as reported by the patient. Likewise, the safety profile was very similar to what we saw in the RAPID study in PSVT, uh, mostly uh, AEs related to the nasal route of administration. In this study, we did have two SAEs for bradyarrhythmia on drug in a single patient, so I'll show you a little more about those. 
That patient uh, had a history of vasovagal events, so fainting. Um, and they, they, during the study of administration of a rather acidic spray, so it's a little irritating on the nose, they had a severe bradycardia and syncope, uh, which was assessed as due to as a vasovagal event due to hypervagotonia. And it uh, fully resolved by patient to place, place in the patient flat, and there were no sequelae. There were also four SAEs in the placebo group in two different patients. None of these were deemed to be um, particularly problematic because in 1,600 patients, we've never seen anything like this in the program for PSVT. So going forward, uh, we have alignment with the FDA that we can conduct a single study, phase three, to file an SNDA. The primary endpoint will be, as in Rivera, will be a reduction in rate. We will also measure, again, duration and speed of onset. And we will also have to uh, hit, with a statistical value, p-value, uh, a secondary endpoint of symptom relief in order to get a label in the United States. We expect to be able to start, uh, file this study protocol with the FDA in the first quarter of next year, start the study in the middle of 2024, and complete the study by the middle of 2026. So roughly a two-year study in 150 to 200 patients. Again, as I mentioned, these are large opportunities. Uh, so let me show you now a little bit about how we think about the market opportunity from a commercial perspective. The value proposition here is quite simple. Patients value the control that they get from being able to manage these episodes without medical intervention from a doctor or a hospital. Physicians have no way of managing these patients now outside of their care, and so they like having a tool that's dependable, well understood and known to them. They've been prescribing these types of products in this class for 30 years. Uh, and it's been shown to be safe. And the insurance companies like the concept that we will be able to uh, reduce emergency department visits. On the left-hand side of this panel, you'll see how patients with PSVT are currently treated with either chronic medications, uh, one-off pill in pocket at the time of an episode, no treatments or a procedure called an ablation to, uh, to basically burn or, or, or freeze tissue in the heart. Uh, and pay, and uh, cardiologists that we asked, 250 of them, indicated broad use in all these types of patients, whether it's pill in pocket, chronic medications, or no current treatment, with a, a stated adoption of almost 50%. And this has been a very consistent finding in all of our market research. In atrial fibrillation now, what patients have available to them today is in patient number three on the right-hand chart, you can see they can wait a long time until they get to the emergency department and then get an IV drug to drop their rate, which is not ideal. They can take a pill in pocket, an oral metoprolol or beta blocker, and that's patient number two with a slow onset of action and generally not as, as much as you can get with an IV. Or you can take in patient number one, a self-administered drug like a tripamil where you would see a reduction in rate similar to what you get in the emergency department, but you can do it right away and hopefully avoid the emergency department visit overall. Physicians tell us they would use uh, the drug, a, a tripamil in atrial fibrillation, both as a standalone treatment in patients who have short episodes of AFib with rapid rate. They'd use it as a bridge to get patients to chronic rate or rhythm control. They'd use it after ablations to make the procedure more effective and have less what's called AFib storm after the procedure. And they'd even imagine using it in a hospital instead of an IV. Overall, a broad uh, set of use cases. This chart shows the, the a market opportunity for PSVT and AFib, demonstrating north of 400, uh, sorry, 4 million patients in the target addressable market and a treatable population in PSVT where we've done more work, so I've worked out uh, more of the chart here, uh, of two and a half to four million episodes at peak uh, based on 50% stated adoption, a 50% target addressable market, and roughly five uses per year per patient. From a financial standpoint, we currently have uh, $75 million uh, on hand and another 75 million committed at approval for a total of $150 million, which we believe will get us uh, six to nine months past approval, which we would expect within a year of our PDUFA date or a year of our filing, which would be the fourth quarter of next year. In total, we have a little over 43 million shares outstanding. And that's the, the investment thesis for Milestone, single asset, simple story, late stage asset that is uh, a year away from approval for a lead indication 
and then with a second indication two or three years behind it. In a case where there is no competitive uh, product and no alternative treatments for these patients, and ideally would keep them, many of them, out of the hospital and would reduce healthcare costs overall. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Lauren. So uh, there's a few questions that we collected uh, in the past few days ahead of time from the investors. The first question is for the, uh, regarding your the commercial launch for the PSVT uh, part. Uh, do, do you have the team to execute that? Can you uh, sort of tell us more on that, that team? Because it's different from doing research than a commercial launch program. Sure. I'm a commercial guy, so I've been launching drugs my whole career. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we've built a leadership team. Uh, we have medical affairs already in the field, uh, field medical people talking to key opinion leaders. We have marketing, market access, uh, and operations filled with leadership. We've developed some strategic partnerships with agencies and other groups that will help us make the launch more efficient. So we will be prepared to launch the drug should we get approval in October of 2024. Okay, the next question is asking about do you have any updated milestone timelines uh, for next year, 2024, what are the sort of major milestones that people should follow? Yeah, so the catalysts really are, uh, the FDA would accept our file in December of this year, 60 days after we submitted it. Uh, we expect to uh, be able to uh, approach the FDA for uh, the protocol that we would have for AFib. And so we would be able to start that study based on positive feedback uh, in a in the phase two meeting uh, in the first quarter of next year. Uh, and then we would obviously uh, have our approval uh, in October for the PSVT indication. So three pretty significant uh, catalyt catalytic milestones within uh, 2024. Yes, yeah, so another question uh, is about your phase three on the atrial fibrillation. How, how, what do you think of uh, how much capital uh, or will be needed to complete uh, to the, the phase three of that? Excellent question. So this study, as you probably noted, is similar in size to our PSVT phase three program, uh, which costs somewhere on the order of 25 to 30 million US dollars. And so we would expect a similar cost over the two years to complete that study and uh, file the drug. So there's one more question I'm taking from the live audience here. And he's asking about a triple mill. So what was the, I would say, the market size? Because you mentioned a bit uh, on the 2030 with the, the peak uh, sales. So what sort of amount are we looking for? Yeah, within the United States, we expect pricing, net sales pricing to be somewhere between $500 and $1,000 per episode. So when you dollarize uh, two and a half to four million episodes treated, you easily get north of a, a billion dollars in peak net sales. In for PSVT, and we expect atrial fibrillation to be at least that big, probably a little bigger, given the significantly larger prevalence. Really, that's a lot of upside there. So th thank you. I think we uh, you address uh, pretty much all the questions here. Uh, thank you for your time here with us, Lawrence. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm.